was simply change the word speed to acceleration and they would have fixed the document. Why did they do this complete reanalysis? That seemed over and above. I have a speculation and it's purely a speculation, but um, I, I think it, it has some merit. Uh, it, it occurs to me that somebody at NIST actually has some integrity. <laughs> Probably a lot of people at NIST have integrity and they, they didn't want to sign their names to this kind of a document. There's good scientists at NIST and they're being controlled by political hacks. These guys at the top, it's like the Bush administration on many occasions uh, overrode the science by political considerations and that was happening here. So the people at the top were determining what was going to be in the report and I'm sure that the scientists who actually did have integrity were chafing under this um, kind of a situation. And what I see as a possibility is that what uh, Stephen Jones and I did was actually create an opening and somebody at NIST picked up the ball and ran with it. This gave them an opportunity. They had committed to do a change and this was their opportunity to actually do something real. And they put in the change. Possibly, I don't know for what happened, I don't know the internal dynamics, possibly John Gross got pulled off of the committee or something that was doing this, or something else. I'm not really sure all the players and the roles they took, but somebody did something there. I just want to address this fact. There are good people within NIST who need to come forward. We need Daniel Ellsberg type people in this situation to come forward and make themselves known and make what they know public because this is what it's going to take to really break this thing open. We can point out flaws, we can point out the obvious, we can point out the physics and so forth, but what it's going to take possibly to actually get some action on the 9-11 truth to actually see justice done is to have people who know what happened uh, come forward and tell what they know. Okay, now let's see how many people are going to argue with that on the blogs when we take care of it, uh, when we check it out again. Anyway, take a look at uh, the end here of my show and you'll see my email. Um, you can email me at 911WAIJ, that's 911 was an inside job, uh, at gmail.com or you can use the 251 Omega at Comcast.net, whatever you prefer. And let me know what you think of it. Well, right now we're going to go into the Bob Bowman video, and Bob Bowman was a retired lieutenant colonel. I had his a speech of his called Treason, where he labeled the 9-11 event as treason. Well, as usual, Bob has something good to say. If you don't know anything about Bob Bowman, he's the commander of the, the Patriots. It's, it's not a militia. It's a peace, peaceful, nonviolent group based... Uh, entirely around the events that are happening now and its membership includes a lot of military brass it's it's kind of a hawkish thing but you know speaking as a liberal peacenik they're hawks I can live with so without further ado let's go to Bob Bowman satellites would watch the world below, detect Soviet missiles blasting off, compute the position and speed of each missile, alert battle stations in space on Earth. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob Bowman, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Air Force, retired. My Ph.D. is in aeronautics and nuclear engineering from Caltech. I flew 101 combat missions in Vietnam and directed all the Star Wars programs under Presidents Ford and Carter when their existence was secret. I'm national commander of the Patriots, a nonprofit organization devoted to a government which follows the Constitution, honors the truth, 
and serves the people. For the last couple of years of the Bush administration, one of the main goals of our organization, the Patriots, was to prevent an attack on Iran. I even wrote a letter to the Pentagon in September 2007 reminding the commanding generals and admirals that their oath of office is to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Their oath is not to obey any order, no matter what. As a matter of fact, in the Nuremberg Principles, which the United States established at the end of World War II, we specifically state that soldiers of all ranks have not only the right but the duty to refuse an illegal order. And we executed Nazis who did the wrong thing and their defense was they were just following orders. In that letter to the Pentagon, I told them that if Dick Cheney or somebody comes down to the Pentagon and says, go nuke Iran, they should not only refuse that order, they should arrest whoever gave it as a war criminal. Now that was 2007. Uh, here we are a couple years later, and Iran is still on the table. It's true that we have perhaps uh, folks in charge now who are less likely to go off half-cocked and nuke Iran, but their threat of military action is still there. And what's worse, we have the Vice President of the United States essentially giving Israel a green light to go do the dirty work themselves. And I think that's wrong. I think the word that we should be giving Israel, both publicly and privately, is if they initiate aggressive war against Iran, or anybody else, that all U.S. aid for Israel will cease immediately. For the last 27 years, I've been a full-time truth-teller, and this has not endeared me to the establishment. Uh, I have been uh, subject to bribes, blackmail, death threats, FBI, CIA, and IRS harassment, uh, three audits in two years. And what for? For telling the truth. As a matter of fact, when I blew the whistle on Reagan's Star Wars scheme for attempting to deploy offensive weapons disguised as defense for the purpose of uh, regaining absolute military superiority and allowing the United States to execute a first strike against the Soviet Union, aggressive war, uh, a war crime, and uh, only lose 20 million Americans in the process. That was their definition of victory. Well, <clears throat> I, I did speak out against it. And most of that was at the specific request of Reagan's own Joint Chiefs of Staff. I'd been speaking out on Star Wars and telling the truth in bits and pieces and uh, briefing members of Congress and senators on what was happening. And in 1982, uh, several of my articles on Star Wars were published in the Congressional Record. But then in 1983, Reagan gave his infamous Star Wars speech in which he pretended to invent the whole thing. And shortly after that, Reagan's own 
Joint Chiefs of Staff called me into the Pentagon and pleaded with me to warn Congress and the American people about this military lunacy, and that's their words, not mine. You see, there was a gag order imposed by the Reagan administration on all military, all on active duty, and all those who retired during Reagan's administration. The only reason they had no hold on me was because I retired before Reagan took office. So the JCS said, you know, Bob, you directed all the Star Wars programs, you know what's going on, very few people in the world do, and you can tell folks. Uh, they pleaded with me also to warn uh, the senators about what the Reagan administration was planning on doing with the shuttle, and that's testing Star Wars weapons, weapons designed to be fired from space against targets on the surface of the Earth, hitting them without warning, destroying hard targets like missile silos and command bunkers totally without warning. They wanted to test this out of the space shuttle, and the JCS thought this is going to confirm all the fears of the Soviet Union that the shuttle is just a weapon. So I did. I went to Congress and told the story, and I gave over 5,000 public lectures against Reagan's Star Wars speech. Uh, there were a lot of great adventures at that time. One of the, those speeches was in Moscow, where I debated Star Wars against uh, U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union, Jack Matlock, who had been one of Reagan's chief arms control negotiators. And uh, after I devastatingly convinced everybody, including Matlock, that uh, Star Wars would be absolutely useless as a defense against a Soviet attack, he admitted that, but said, wouldn't you like to have Star Wars if uh, Gaddafi got the bomb? And I said, no. If I was a, a, a terrorist or a rogue dictator and finally got my hands on enough plutonium to make a homemade bomb, the last thing in the world I would do would be to start a 15-year development program to build me an ICBM. I would just float that nuke up the Potomac on a barge or fly it into Red Square in a Cessna. Well, the whole audience, 4,000 physicians from around the world, erupted in laughter and applause. You see, at that moment, Matthias Roost Cessna was sitting there in Red Square. We had watched it the night before. I was probably the first person in Moscow to see it coming. We watched it circle three times trying to land, and then when the people cleared out of the way, finally landed in Red Square. And he stood there for half an hour signing autographs, uh, waiting uh, for the police to show up and arrest him. Later that evening, uh, again this was the night before my debate with Matlock, I was at the rooftop restaurant of the Rosia Hotel overlooking Red Square and there was Matthias Ruth Cessna still sitting there in Red Square. But in the background there were fireworks going off all around the city. It was Frontier Day. The Soviets we're celebrating the vigilance of their border guards. So you can understand where when I talked the next day about just flying their nuke into Red Square in a Cessna, uh, this was very interesting. To it was even written up in the New Yorker magazine. So Star Wars was the time I really came out uh, against 